We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all melding into one. My name is Christina Giordano. I'm a partnerships manager here at All Voices, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. I'm really excited to invite today our guest, Cornell Verde Verdeja Woodson, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Headspace. How are you, Cornell? I'm doing well, Christina. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Just learned a fellow New Jerseyan uh, yes. as well. Um, yes. But for those who are listening, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns and, you know, a fun hobby that you like to do in your spare time when you're not working? Yeah. Woo, my spare time. Woo. <laughs> um, so my name again is Cornell Verdeja Woodson, director of DEI at Headspace. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I live in San Leandro, California, uh, with my husband and our two dogs, London and Rome, um, who at some point may barge into this room. Um, <laughs> so that may happen. Um, and yeah, my background originally is in higher education. I worked at uh, Cornell University. I know Cornell at Cornell. Uh, worked at NYU, and my master's is in higher ed, uh, but made the switch into tech about two years ago mm -hmm. um, and have really enjoyed my experience in helping to really help tech organizations and organizations in general. Um, to really rethink how they look at the workplace and how they create spaces of belonging for everyone, but particularly for our marginalized communities. And then one thing, oh, hobby, 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 something in my spare time. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> During the pandemic, it's really been about good TV, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. You know, you, you spend your day at the desk dealing with a lot of hard stuff and trying to support, you know, employees. And so I like to watch comedy and just find a good, you know, uh, I think uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine is one of my yes. favorite shows and rewatching Living Single and things <laughs> that sort, you know, things I can laugh to and just relax to. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I am also in the camp of not wanting to watch like Criminal Minds or SVU. After work, I'm just like, I cannot, I cannot I do cannot. it. Uh, so I love, I love that. Can you tell us a little bit about, I know you touched on it earlier in terms of your background and being in higher education and really wanting to get into this work, like why diversity, equity, and inclusion and why at Headspace? Yeah. You know, I, I, I fell into this, this, this profession. Uh, in college, I was pre-med. I thought I was going to be a doctor. Uh, I thought, mm. right. I, my goal was to be GYN. <laughs> And I was going to cure cervical cancer because, you know, I had, you know, so many of the women that raised me had such bad experiences with doctors, with their doctors. And, um, and I think communities of women of color in particular have really not great experiences with their doctors. And I wanted to change the industry and fail organic chemistry miserably. I'm talking about straight F <laughs> and decided, OK, no. So this is not in my future. Um, and but I knew that the foundation and the, you know, the theme of what I wanted to do was to change the world. And so I graduated from Ithaca College, did Teach for America in Atlanta, Georgia. And there is where I would argue my DEI journey really began because I started understanding from, I was no longer the poor boy from Camden, New Jersey. I was an educated black man with access to a particular amount of wealth. And I was on a different side of the table with privilege and understanding it from that lens. And then um, really just started doing more trainings, going and got a master's in higher ed, sort of do, started doing trainings at NYU and kind of just fell into this. Um, why a headspace? Because it their vision is something that is so deeply personal to me. You know, our vision at Headspace is really to improve the health and happiness of the world. And that's what DEI is really about, right? It's about creating spaces for people to not be able to just survive, but to thrive. And with that as a vision mixed in with equitable practices and behaviors, we can really make some awesome change and also be a leader in the space. I love that. It sounds like it is deeply personal for you. You're so passionate about it. And it's something that you just can't teach that passion of just wanting to do this really hard work that does involve a lot of emotional labor. There's a lot of intricacies to it as well. And something yeah. we said too was creating space for people to thrive, not only survive. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about Headspace and your diversity, equity, and inclusion belonging strategy there and how you really create that for um, your fellow employees there? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So Headspace is really um, just starting on their journey. I think like many other organizations, you know, last summer really started realizing, wait, we're not doing what we need to be doing in order to really ensure that at the time our Black employees, but now our Asian employees, our caregivers, yeah. right, queer people, you know, everyone that what we're doing internally matches what we're trying to share externally. And so they took a real honest look at themselves and said, we've got to move forward. We've got to hire a leader that can help us and really move us forward. And so what we're really doing at this point is really looking at our data. I'm having, I've only been at Space for six months. And mm -hmm. so I spent the last, uh, the first three months looking at data, collecting data, talking with, you know, all the different groups, talking with our Black employees, our Asian employees, the women, everyone, and getting a sense of what's going on, where are we currently, right? And having an honest conversation about what that looks like, and then talking about where do we want to go? What's the, what's, yeah. what's the end goal here? And then backwards planning, as we used to do when, when, when I was a teacher, we always, what do, I want, what, what, what do I want my students to know at the end of the year? And then how are we gonna get there? And then really having some honest conversations about what's going on with our senior leaders and how they can help us move towards that goal. So we're looking at our hiring, obviously. We're looking at um, how we're filling that top of funnel. We're looking at our engagement score, our psychological, uh, our psychological safety score, our belonging score, and looking at the groups that are most having not having the best experience, particularly in those three areas. Um, and we're implementing those strategies in order to really help turn that around. Yeah, I love to hear that it is very data driven. You're doing a lot of employee listening. And what a six months to start at a company and really dig into. Who are you telling? <laughs> I uh, I can only imagine your schedule is packed and there's not a day that goes by where there's just not, there's so much to do and the work just continues. And something else you mentioned was that psychological safety, so many people are talking about it now and how to yes. really intentionally, it's not a passive process of creating that for their employees as we are diving into the future of work, whatever that looks like, hybrid, remote, um, you know, a combination of, of both. Um, in your experience, what is really important to ensure that employees um, really feel that they are part of the culture and that they are being invited to the table and really part of that conversation? Yeah, I really think that there has to be a strong level of transparency, right? I think when you look at where most companies get in trouble, it's because they're not being clear about how decisions are being made and what data we looked at that drove us to that decision. Right. And they're not also creating an open door policy where not only are we sharing where our opportunities are for decision making, we're also creating a space where you can give us your thoughts and insights on where we need to go and allowing the employees to share their thoughts from their vantage point and then using that information to make the best possible decision. Are we going to please everyone? No. But can we look back? And I, I argue most companies can't do this. Most companies can't look back and go, did we include the entire community in this process when we made this decision? And most cannot say that, right? And I, and I think that's something that we're working really hard in doing. And I think that many more organizations need to do as well. I think the other thing is listening to our employees when they tell us what's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly when you're a senior leader, you're not where all your individual contributors or even your people managers are, right? It's your people managers and your individual contributors who are really on the ground and are seeing things for what they are. And so really relying on that group to help educate you and keep you in the know about what's really happening helps you make better decisions at the top, right? Um, and so I think that's really critical that we stay in touch with our employees and we listen to them actively and then we follow through on the, those behaviors. I mean, how many times have we, you know, completed a survey and go, this ain't going nowhere. They're not going to do nothing about this, right? <laughs> so you yeah. give me the opportunity to share, but what are you going to do with it? Where's the follow through? Those are things I think are really critical for employees to go, wow, that things might not be perfect, but if I bring something up, I have faith that my leaders will do something with that information. Absolutely. It's a 360 degree process because once you build that culture of trust, which is very hard to do and your employees are sharing their, you know, unapologetically honest uh -huh. um, feedback with you, that's that's great. That's a privilege that you have that. And now it's the next step of, OK, what are you going to do with it? And they're going to be less likely to share that if no one does anything and there's no action or follow up on it. So the continual conversation, not just a one and done um, you know, ask for feedback and then that's it. We check the box. 
And the other thing I'd add to that too is that we have to be careful because many of these organizations are predominantly white, predominantly male. And so we can't just listen to the the majority in terms of an an, an end count perspective. We've also got to double click into where are the other communities that exist within our company and specifically what are they saying about what it means to work here and what it feels like. And really, in my opinion, when we center our decisions and our strategies around the most marginalized, we build for everyone. Absolutely. I love that. Double click into those communities. I'm going to use that now. Absolutely. Good, good, good. You can have it. (laughs) Yes. Um, I think that is really important because you need to meet employees where they are. And like you said, you can't, you know, please everybody, but you need to focus on people who are less likely to give you feedback or just offer these different channels in order for them to feel psychologically safe to do so and included part of the process. Uh, You mentioned that Headspace's, you know, goal and just mission is to get happier, get healthier for companies, individuals, um, and mental health on a whole is a conversation that we are talking about more since this last year. Um, How does Headspace really think about the mindfulness and mental health of their employees? Yes, this is my favorite question. (laughs) I'm really proud of what Headspace does in this space. You know, we really recognize that when you take care of your employees, everything else succeeds, right? Because, you know, we're nothing without our employees. There's no business if there aren't employees doing the work. And so what we, what they were doing before I even got there was every other Friday is a no meeting Friday where Ooh. no meetings are allowed to be. You can have meetings with external folks, yeah, but you cannot have meetings where internal people have to show up. You just can't do that, right? Um, and the other Friday is a mindful day, a day off. So we technically operate on a four day work week. Right. Um, And recognizing that we got to take care of our people. We got to give them the space and not say, hey, feel free to take off every other Friday. No, no, no. We're going to put it on your calendar. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because what we know is that marginalized groups. Right. Won't do that. Women won't do that because what does that, because what does it look like if I'm taking off every other Friday, right? Yep. No, if, if it matters to us, we're going to make it a company thing. Everybody is not allowed to have meetings or should be away from their computer and away from work on the other Friday. The other thing that we do is at on Monday through Thursday, every 10 a.m. Pacific time and 3 p.m. Pacific time are mindful moments. And at the 10 a.m. block for, for 30 minutes, we have company-wide led meditation. And you don't have to participate, but it's there for you to do so. And usually we have a pretty good crowd that shows up to meditate together. But ultimately, it's for you to do whatever you want during that 30 minutes. Get up and go for a walk. Go walk the dogs. Get your coffee. Get your water. Go to the bathroom. Go stretch. Go watch your favorite episode (laughs) of Living Single. Right? Like (laughs) whatever it is you need to do, that's your time. And no meetings are supposed to happen during those 30-minute blocks. So those are two big things, in my opinion, that are so different from what, you know, so what different. culture is typically like, right? That we're saying like our employees matter and here's how we're doing that or, or showing that they do. Yeah. And that's putting that into the process, baking it in there and not just saying we have unlimited PTO, you can use it. But studies have shown no, a lot of folks and especially folks that come from marginalized communities are not going to take it because of the optics of that as exactly. well. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm personally a large fan of the four day work week. So that's interesting to yes. hear that you have put that into place at Headspace too. And I know for, this is related to diversity, equity, and inclusion and Mm -hmm. mindfulness too, because they are a little bit intangible kind of topics because a lot of people, especially in marketing and sales, they have very clear goals of how Mm -hmm. you achieved X to get to Y. When you think about the ROI of mindfulness and giving, um, you know, this time to employees, making sure that you're super intentional about it. How do you think about really showing the, the impact of that? Yeah, I think for me, it shows, I mean, hardcore shows in our engagement survey data, right, that our employees are happy to work here, they would recommend Headspace as a great place to work for other people, right, so I think to me, there's a direct correlation by when you take care of your employees and create this sense of mindfulness to how they feel about being an employee in the space, but then just overall productivity, right? Are we meeting deadlines? Are there less conversations around missed deadlines? Are we, uh, you know, uh, people meeting their goals from a sales perspective or things of that sort? Um, are people taking less days off, right? Because they're not as exhausted because we're taking care of them throughout the week and not just right. those moments where their body really needs it. I'm a ha- I have a habit of that. 
I'll take off when my body's like, uh, it's time, you're sick, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. But we're, we're we're proactive about it. So I think you know those ways are ways in which we're we're being able to 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 tell that this is working, right? That people are recommending Headspace as a great place to work. They're happy to be here. They're more productive. They're happier, right? Through the attitudes and the energy that you see within meetings and things of that sort, because they have that time to be able to step away and not feel guilty about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important. The way that you measure it is you simply ask. You ask how employees are feeling and you listen to that as well. And it is a strategy that is super dynamic. Again, you don't just set it and forget it. So the way that employees feel does change over time. Um, I know we talked about this earlier too, in terms of this is something that is being created as we speak, like most companies, but Mm -hmm. return to office. What is really important to you, um, especially from a DEI perspective, accessibility, inclusion, um, to really think about, you know, returning to work uh, at Headspace? Yeah, for me, from a DEI perspective, and I say for us as a company in general, it's creating opportunities and options that meet people where they are. The reality of it is there are going to be some people who are not ready to come back to the office for a whole gamut of reasons, right? They have to find childcare again. Childcare may not open the same time that we go back to the office, right? So there are so many things that have to get taken care of to make sure that I can actually return back to going, commuting to to work. So are we creating options in a a layered uh, uh, strategy that allow people to return at different times or for people to choose to not go back to the office if they don't have to, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So for example, I know for me, I'm much more productive working from my home office. Do I have that option to either be at home full time or to be able to, you know, two days in and the rest of, you know, the the week out? Um, So really giving options and meeting people's needs, whether that's childcare or just fear of like, I'm not ready to go back to a space where there's a whole bunch of people around me. I'm just nervous or I have pre-existing conditions that make it a little bit more necessary for me to be extra cautious before returning back to work, right? So are we really making sure that we're taking all those things into account and giving people that that, that leeway um, to be able to make the decision for themselves when they return to the office? Yeah, again, meeting employees where they are and really listening to why they may be hesitant and coming back into the office five days a week for 40 hours. And I just think the future of work has a lot of different changes ahead of them. And we have a lot of opportunity to create these really equitable systems that you are talking about in terms of listening to the full picture of who yeah. someone is as a human. And, and having a kind of conversation of, does every role need to be in, in an office? <laughs> is that necessary or is that our like, this is the way it's always been done? mentality, right? Um, because I th- also think that a re- a more remote workforce will also help us when it comes to inclusive hiring, right? That there are going to be people who, Black people, Asian people, Latinx people, who don't want to relocate to the Bay Area or where our offices are in order to have a job here because they have children, they want to you know raise them in a more diverse space, right? How are we creating that? Or just can't because they're taking care of elderly parents or whatever that may be. How are we creating and increasing the opportunity for people to join our Headspace family or our, our tech family, um, but not having to pick up their entire lives and move? So that re- remote workforce really can help us in a major way that I don't, that I don't think em- employers have under- understand quite yet. Absolutely. I think that accessibility piece of roles that are fully remote or have the option to be not near either like an HQ of a company and just be in cities that are really expensive most of the time. And like you said, if you want to be in more diverse areas, if you want to be closer to family, it's just a whole host of other options that um, you know, add an additional layer to the conversation, but it's a real opportunity for companies to really attract uh, talent that they wouldn't have otherwise. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that this is something that we have been continually talking about in this discussion, but it, I think it is really important to dig into why it's really important to build this sense of culture of trust, inclusion, and belonging at a company and how you really see that manifesting at Headspace um, and the workspace overall. Yeah, I think trust is so critical because, you know, when people don't feel like they can trust their employer or trust their people manager or even the people that they work with, they leave. Right. We're seeing this now that people no longer stay at a company for the sake of, you know, putting in 25 years at a company or loyalty. No, when we're unhappy, we get up and we go. 
right? And we get some criticism for that, but I think, yeah. you know, we recognize our value. You need me. Yes, I need this paycheck, but there are a lot of companies that I can go to. And if you're not going to, if I don't feel that I can trust you, then I, I can't trust you with, with my career development, with, you know, uh, evaluating my performance fairly, uh, responding to my, my concerns in an appropriate manner, in a timely manner, then I'm going to go find some place where that does happen or mm-hmm. happens at least more, right? Because I don't think any place is perfect. And so we end up seeing a revolving door of talent go in and out. And how much does that cost an employer to recruit and hire and onboard a single individual? I think the, the data shows what, fourteen to $16,000 per person, right? And mm-hmm. maybe more for some companies and less, right? But that's yeah. a lot of money that you're just spending and losing because you're not doing taking the time to be people first and people centered. Right, um, and how we manage the, these companies, and then I also think from a pr- productivity level. How many times have we been in a company where we didn't really feel like we felt valued, and we didn't trust the people that were leading us, and I wasn't motivated to do my all. I did the bare minimum because I, I had to take my job and get <laughs> yeah. my paycheck. But you could get so much more out of me if I feel like this is home. Right? To me, trust is like the equivalent of like feeling I'm home. You know, I can let my guard down, and so there's so much at stake here when we don't establish and work on the level of trust that we have with our employees. That is the reality, though. If you are not offering this level of trust, if you're not thinking about this longer term strategy of investing in an employee, you will lose talent because others are really progressive and they're thinking about it. They're thinking of restructuring their systems and not just doing things the way that they have been or going back to quote unquote normal, because this is a real option to create new strategies, be creative and inclusive design, which I think is super important as well. Um, Are there any other trends that you're seeing, whether it's in the people space, um, the DEI space, or more generally that companies um, and leaders or managers really need to understand and, you know, embed in their practices to be successful and keep up with the times? Yeah, I think that going back to that trust piece is also important when it comes to making mistakes, right? That when I trust that you mean well, when I trust that you have my, my interests at heart, when mistakes are made, I can give you some grace and some leeway, right? I find that most people, most of our communities, when we really double down on an organization, because we didn't trust you in the first place. And this was just a notch on, you know, on, on, on that graph of why, right? And so that, that was happening before. So that just really establishing that. I think the other thing is really knowing your direct reports. And this is more for like uh, people managers, right? right? Knowing who your team is, knowing who they are beyond the role that I am not just your director of diversity, equity, inclusion. I'm a whole human being who is black, gay, a cisgendered man, married. You know, like I have all this, I I, I struggle with with stress and anxiety. I have all these things and all that matters because I I bring that with me everywhere I go. I don't leave that stuff at the door or, you know, outside this door when I sit down at this computer. So it impacts me. Um, and so being able to, to understand me beyond the role means that you can do a better job supporting me when I need it most. And really, again, going back to that people-centered approach of what, to, what does my team need? Checking in with my team, you know, to say, hey, you may not know what you need right now, but I'm here whenever you figure that out. And here are the things I'm going to be doing in the background to support you and remove barriers out of your way so that you can just focus on you and do what you need to do. Absolutely. I think that's important to highlight as well, because I think a lot of people, especially organizations, leaders um, are hesitant to offer support or say the wrong thing or, you know, make a mistake. And that building trust goes both ways of just having a conversation around the intention behind it, having a growth mindset as well, um, and really working together if like the intentions are aligned to and that you both want to create this really inclusive workplace where you can both, again, thrive in in this situation. Um, So I think that definitely makes sense. Um, I also wanted to ask, you know, related to the work that you do, do you meditate and where is your favorite place to meditate? Yeah. So I I don't necessarily meditate the way I think Headspace does it, right? Uh, You know, I think that meditation and and our, one of our founders, uh, Andy, he would say the same things that, yeah, this is a, this is a, this is one way meditation can look, but meditation can be many other things. I have a friend of mine who um, is big into um, uh, taking care of plants. He's, he's actually the plant queen on Instagram and his form of meditation is repotting his plants, getting his hand into the dirt right? And just kind of being connected. And through that, he is his increased awareness with himself. So for me, 
it could be sitting, you know, we bought a hot tub during the pandemic. So, so we could have some space. So I might get in the hot tub early in the morning before I come, you know, sit at the desk and sit in silence for 30 minutes, right? Um, I may listen to music and just kind of sit and lay down while the music plays. There are times where I'm listening to an old show in the background, but I'm laying down and just kind of like with my eyes closed, but listening to it, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, those are the ways in which I kind of walk away from things and kind of reconnect with myself and raise my own awareness about what's going on for me. And usually in a time, do I realize I haven't eaten today, haven't gone to the bathroom yet, and oh <laughs> things of that sort. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love that though, because there are different ways of looking at recentering yourself and checking in with yourself and your body that don't involve you sitting completely still with your eyes closed in a dark room. That's not, you know, that's not for everybody, but there are ways that you can just ask yourselves those really important questions um, and just check in. Exactly. And for some people, it's taking a walk with dog, right? It's going for a hike, right? Whatever that may be for you that helps you reconnect with yourself do what you got to do. Right. But I, what I always tell people, but choose you choose yourself every once in a while during throughout the day to check in with yourself. Yeah. And that is an active choice too. That doesn't yes. like happen. It's just, you know, put it on your calendar. Like yes. that does as well. It's just important that you do factor that in because if you don't, it, it time passes and it's the end of the day. And you're like, instead of checking in with yourself, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of these, but in terms of a proudest moment for the work that you do, uh, whether it's at Headspace or otherwise, um, what can you share with like the folks that are listening in terms of this is a moment in time, whether it's small or big, where you had a moment of flow and you were really connected to it and you're like, this is where I'm supposed to be at this exact time and place. Mm, it's a great question. There are two things that happen often that I'm, that I'm always in my prop that I feel proud of the work that I'm doing. It's when someone has an aha moment where something I said, or maybe a speaker that I brought in to educate us on a topic made someone go, whoa, okay, wow, that makes sense. Or I didn't think about it that way before, or I never heard of that before. Oh my goodness. Right. And there's some epiphany that, 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 and uh, their, their level of awareness has been increased dramatically because of something I said or presented or someone that I brought in to, you know, do some kind of training. But then the other piece that really is my ultimate goal is it makes them change behavior. So for example, you know, we uh, brought in um, a trainer to uh, talk about trans inclusion. Um, Amazing. And um, many of the folks at Headspace had never really, you know, they, they knew what transgender was, but didn't really understand it, didn't understand pronouns and how to ask and why, it's like that. Now, all of a sudden, you see in our Slack channels, people asking, how do I change my, my app, app, my pronouns to yeah. my Zoom? How do I change them in Slack? Like, they're doing the thing, you know, that we've asked them to do, and you actively see it constantly. So it's those moments where I go, oh, wow, there it is, right? And, and yeah, it's small. It, did, it didn't change policy. It didn't change a law or anything, which we need as well, but it did create some kind of change in how people show up in a space that has a profound impact on a trans person seeing their colleagues go, hey, this matters. So let's let me I want to participate and make sure I'm doing what's right as well. You know, so yeah. those are those two moments. Those are great moments, even though they're kind of smaller on a daily basis. I think for behavioral change, which and cultural change that doesn't happen overnight, those are really necessary. And that larger shift could not happen if folks didn't have that aha moment and just like understand that, oh, this is something that I didn't know before. And I'm going to put it into my daily practices or process as an individual contributor too, as a company and an ideal world in your day-to-day -day life outside of work too. Right. Exactly. And they have long-term impact, right? It may be happening on a minute scale, but it has a long-term impact. If people are putting them in their email, you know, signatures, and they're also asking people during meetings, hey, let's all go around and share our, our uh, gender pronouns, right? Absolutely. Like, and they're doing it in that way that really goes, wow, okay, this is what this feels like to be seen. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know? this is what it feels like to be seen. And you're also making space for someone else not to have that conversation of, we have to, you know, start using everyone's pronouns because like, these are my pronouns and you're just right. putting someone in a better position to have a more inclusive experience overall. Yeah. Which yep. is great. Absolutely. Um, 
Time is literally flying by, but I have just one last question for okay. you in terms of if there's anything else that you would like to share. I know we covered a lot today. Also, how people can get in touch with you if they have questions about some of the insights that you provided or just want to comment on the really important and good work that you are doing. Yeah, you know, I think if I had anything to share, particularly if there's anyone who is like, just starting out on their journey towards understanding DEI or, or, or trying to get it started at their company, which is usually a pretty often scenario, yeah. um, is that it takes time, but we it's necessary, right? To, to lean into the work that it takes to, to really get these things going and to, to help our senior leaders have a change of heart and change of mind around why this is necessary. But also finding your community is really critical for support because oftentimes it's us folks of color and people from marginalized groups who are queer and trans and with you know women who are the ones trying to inspire companies to get this done and so self-care is so critical i can't stress that enough that you have to take care of yourself and sometimes that means walking away from that stuff because guess what those problems will be there when you get back <laughs> <laughs> and so if you need a week off or a week away or whatever that may be for you, do it because you're more important to us than, you know, you spending your energy doing this thing, right? Like we, we, we need you here. We want you here um, to get in touch with me. You can find me on Instagram. It's uh, I think my handle is, is it's me Cornell, real simple. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Cornell Verdeja Woodson. Um, and I also am the founder and CEO of a small boutique consulting firm called Break Trainings. And so you can find me there as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Cornell, for your time, you. energy, and just for having this conversation. I know you've been doing lots of interviews lately, so definitely yes. appreciate it. And I hope our folks listening uh, took away some action items that they can embed in their, in their daily lives as well. Yes. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. Um, at All Voices, we believe in the power of everyone to speak up and know that creating a place where employees do feel they could provide that feedback is necessary in order for everyone to succeed. We'll talk later.